Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, welcome to the greatest NZ live political podcast in the world, The Working Group. Hosted by beloved left-wing broadcaster Comrade Bomber Bradbury. With the best political panel in New Zealand media. Reviewing the week. Setting the agenda. Avoiding defamation. The Working Group is brought to you by Gravity Credit Management. When the weight of capitalism is becoming the event horizon of an imploding black hole, call 0800 Gravity and our team will get blood out of a stone. That's 0800 Gravity. This is The Working Group. Kia ora, Aotearoa. I'm your host, the editor of the Daily Blog, Martin Bradbury. QAnon anti-vaxxer incel lunatics to the right of me, insufferably humorless woke cancellation lynch mobs to the left of me. And here I am, dear listener, stuck in the radical middle with you. This is The Working Group, New Zealand's bestestest and greatestestest weekly political podcast that isn't funded by New Zealand On Air. We stream live from the MediaWorks Auckland studio 7.30pm Mondays on Facebook, YouTube, YouTube and the Daily Blog. The podcast is available afterwards on Apple Podcast, Rover, Spotify and YouTube. Our Twitter panel tonight is political commentator and media reviewer Tim Selwyn, who will be commenting using the hashtag NZPOL. Joining me tonight to discuss the big issues in New Zealand politics while commemorating the passing of Meatloaf is the greatest political panel in New Zealand broadcasting. He stuffs best talent after Thomas Coughlin went to the Herald, the libertarian <laughs> liquidator, the Cthulhu of capitalism, the one, the only, Damien, I would do anything for love, but I won't pay tax, Grant, kia ora, comrade. Good to be here, Bomber. As we mark the passing of Meatloaf, favourite performance? The thing I love, the, uh, the one about Leaf, Meatloaf, is when he sang that beautiful song, you took the words right out of my mouth. And the thing that resonates with that is mm. it just shows that fat, ageing, unattractive men can still be sex symbols. And, it, and I think it gives, well, for all three of us here in the studio, perhaps not you, Thomas, but it gives us three certainly hope. Uh, he gave hope to every little fat boy that they too one day could get laid. Yes. Uh, he's the right-wing Loki, the architect of the Death Star, moral shepherd of the right, political commentator and recreational Sith Lord, Matthew Bat out of free market Hal Hooten. Kia ora, comrade. Kia ora. Favourite moment of meat life. I won't do that. Yes, you will. <laughs> <laughs> if the price is right, the price is right Matthew Mr. will Hooten, do it. Mr. Hooten, the past tells us you will do anything for love, including Matt. Including Matt. He won't do it for love, but he will do it for money, Matthew Hooten. Oh, uh, 800 Hooten. <laughs> it's just something we've just heard too often through our long decades of life, isn't it? And he was, Jesus Christ, <laughs> come with an up attitude, save for the personality. And he was the best thing stuff had going for it. The senior political reporter of the New Zealand Herald mainstream media, Bob Boy. Thomas, you took the news right out of my mouth, Coughlin. Kia ora, comrade. Kia ora, comrade. Uh, as my we mark the passing of... Moment before you are. Yeah, well, well, yeah. Yeah. What, what, what was your meatloaf moment? Horror. Rocky Horror Picture Show. I mean, it's a bit, it's a bit cliche, but you know, I, 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 he's 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 before my time, so it's, it's my favourite. Ah, uh, before my time. Yeah, this is why I hate young people. Uh, of course, the Rocky Horror Picture Show was the correct answer. Congratulations, Thomas. <laughs> of course, <laughs> we would have also <laughs> accepted. We would have also accepted his incredible performance in Fight Club. Oh my God, he was so hilariously oh, funny. Yeah, 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 Bob. Uh, tonight, Bob tonight, 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 folks, brothers and sisters, comrades. We look at the big issues. Issue one, Omicron, ready or mm. not? Issue two, Brian Tamaki, Messiah or just a very naughty boy? Issue three, inflation out on the 27th. Will the New Zealand economy falter? And issue four tonight, can a weak Biden stop Putin and the Ukraine? Plus, we'll have a final word at the end of the show where each panellist gets a 90-second rant on any topic they want. Can we breach broadcasting standards this week? My yes, we can. Yes, <laughs> yes, we My can. My is right on Matthew Hooten. <laughs> Amen. Uh, let's kick things off tonight with the product launch of the latest COVID strain into our market. Over the weekend, it was announced that Omicron was finally here in the community and our next phase of the COVID struggle was suddenly upon us. National and ACT are singing from the same hymn sheet, the Labour haven't done enough to prepare for Omicron list of classic hits. It's the usual tedious list of complaints about a health system that is actually moving as fast as it can. All National's bitching is set against the low mortality and hospitalisation rates that only back up Labour's credentials of COVID crisis leadership. Damien, Luxon this week says, if he were the Prime Minister, 
he would be on the phone to every DHB daily to check if they need anything for Omicron. There are 20 DHBs. Let's say he speaks to each for three, for 10 minutes, for 10 minutes, 10 minutes each. That's almost three and a half hours each day he would be calling DHBs. I'm concerned at Luxon's time management. Can criticism, for the sake of criticism, win national votes? Um, is this podcast, do we have authorization from the Labour Party for some of the stuff that you've just been spinning out there? Because these these are these are talking points straight from the beehive, Mr Bradbury. Well, and I, I, I wanna... give them the talking points. So, so, so they've paid for them. They've paid for them. Uh, yeah. Nation, nation, national uh, and act to a lesser extent are in a real bind because what what do they do? Because they can't they they can't really criticise the uh, the government's policy because the government doesn't really have a policy. Uh, they can't really articulate anything in response. All that they can't say what everybody knows what's going to happen is that the government's policy is effectively just to let it rip. So they they they're stuck. Um, and and uh, and the point. The, you get into with this 10 minutes and everything is that Luxon doesn't actually have a plan. He doesn't have an agenda. Luxon's critical problem is he doesn't have a philosophical worldview. So he is completely incapable of looking at any problem from a philosophical lens. He is simply a technocrat tragically out of his, out of his depth. And it's interesting to see in the latest opinion polls come out by the, the, the taxpayer union, um, Luxon's peaked. Yeah. Right, he's yeah. he's actually dropped a couple of uh, percentage yeah. points in preferred uh, prime minister. I still think he's he's going to win because I think the government's going to completely botch it. But I think all that National have to do between now and the next next election is don't blow it. So, D- I don't Damien, FUQ e- e- follow up question: Rapid antigen testing is less effective with Omicron, and seeing as that's Act's main pony in their one trick pony stable, does Act need a new trick or a new pony or both? Uh, look, I just got to get back to talking about guns and free speech because <laughs> tax cuts, and, tax cuts, and and and, tax and, cuts. and tax cuts because because Omicron and COVID probably will not be what drives the election in two years' time. Whatever, whatever happens, whether the Omicron thing turns out to be fairly mild or it's a catastrophe in two years' time, the election will not be fought on uh, uh, Omicron or Delta or Epsilon or whatever the next version comes out. It's going to be it's going to be dealt with on the failure of this government or the success of this government on the on the economic front. So Matthew, need Matthew to worry. Hooten, you wrote that Jacinda must sell the living with the virus strategy strategy despite it causing debts and what you build as a horrific choice. At what point do voters see Labour's cure for the pandemic as worse than the disease? Well, the cure is happening now because we're going to get boosted and then we're all going to get um, Omicron and then we'll have both natural and artificial immunity. Can't wait. And exactly as Damien said, by the time we get to the next election, this should all be behind us. Um, just on your thing with, with Christopher Lux and what National should do, I mean, yeah, I think you're absolutely right, Damien. I think they spend all this time complaining about things going on in Wellington, whether an order was put in for something on a particular day or the previous day or whether the plan has been written or just sort of process stuff. National's message should be this. It should be there is a plan Jacinda Ardern does have a plan. It's called Let It Rip, but she's lying to you about it. She's planning to infect you. She's planning to (laughs) infect Granny, and she hasn't ordered the testing or the hospital capability to look after you. After you, she has a plan, and it's to make you sick. So and that's, that, your, that's your advice. True. That's your advice. Well, I think it's just, <laughs> I th- well, try that. Try that. Well, it's sure as a hell a better line to people than um, there was meant to be. 100,000 RATs arrive yesterday, but now they're coming tomorrow. I mean, but people don't even understand what that means. <clears throat> what they do know is Jacinda Ardern has a plan to infect the population, but she won't tell the truth about it. Follow-up question, Matthew. What pains you most watching the state's collectivist action to intervene and save lives or not getting an invite to Jacinda's now cancelled wedding? Which one? Well, the, the second is factually inaccurate. <laughs> You'd never get an invite. <laughs> the second is factually accurate in all sorts of ways, but I, I don't want to go into them. Thomas, but what was the first bit? Well, the first bit was, <laughs> does it pain you seeing the state's collectivist action save lives? Well, it's fantastic news. I mean, we. <laughs> the, the question was meant to be, is New Zealand ready for Omicron? Yes. And 
I listened to the podium of truth on Sunday and the Prime Minister was asked whether there is a plan for 50,000 daily cases, new daily cases. And she said it was. She said, she said that the government has designed systems yes. to cope with 50,000 new cases a day. We're Are all going to be fine. The pro- our leader has prepared <laughs> for, f- for, for 350,000 people to get sick a week. That's that's the quality of leadership that we that's were pretty talking remarkable. about that's pretty from remarkable. the podium of truth. And who are we to challenge anything well, exactly. that comes out who are from you? Big That's system. right. Thomas, you have been vocal in expressing your concerns with Omicron, noting our low booster rates. What are your fears? My, my fears, I guess, are that yeah, booster rates are really low. The, the worst thing that can happen, like obviously, is that someone can die. You know, sure. you can die from this. Like ridiculously, you, we've got we, we've we've got a variant that you can't prevent from getting into the country. Yes. You can't really prevent it from circling circulating in the community. Yes. Um, but with, it's a, it's such a sort of um, low hanging fruit kind of variant that it's actually a, you know a great variant to. to to circulate through the community because it's because barely anyone will will get seriously sick and die from it. Yeah. Um, if they are vaccinated and boosted, uh, but you know this goes back to the debate we were having last year. Um, not many, well, quite a few people now. Many people are, are double vaccinated, but not many people are, are double vaccinated and boosted. Yeah. And that's not really because of hesitancy or anything. It's because the the initial vaccine rollout was so so slow and sure. hardly anyone is eligible. So I think that you know my greatest fear is that we're actually. Yeah, and, and this is where the, the political debate becomes really difficult. Is that what we're what the political debate should really be focusing on is relitigating that vaccine debate of last year, because that is the that is the, the the handbrake on 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 whether or not you're able to get get boosted or not is when when you got your your second dose last year. Yes. So yeah, I, mean, I guess that's a that's a great fear is that New Zealand stuffs up um, something that we really shouldn't stuff up, which is you know pretty pretty mild, well, you know, relatively mild COVID variant that's actually a great excuse to sort of get some natural immunity going in the community, but, you know. Follow-up question, what do you think the government should be doing with your oversight and seeing what they're actually, where the problems are, where do you think they should be moving now? Oh, well, it's always very dangerous to have journalists in the of government. Co- of course, I, of course I, it I is, but this is the gun. show to do it. This <laughs> is the show to do it, Thomas. Yeah. Well, I think that the big thing is, I think, like a controversial call, but I think it's the one they, they probably they got, probably made the right call on was delaying opening the border because I think that's the key. The, the key decision here is to to flatten the curve and yes. to, to try and reduce pressure on the health system. So obviously we need to open the border. We need to open the border this year. Um, you know I think that's that's a sort of there's no question on that. Um, Delaying opening the border so that you can stop seeding cases in the community, which is what's happened in New South Wales, and yes. stop seeding as well. It's not just Omicron, but it's like it's Delta that's, that's disabling New South Wales. Sure, There's sure. a lot of Delta yeah. coming in through the border and a lot of Delta in the community. So, so kind of making sure that that you're not seeding new Omicron and Delta cases in the community by keeping the border closed for you know however months it takes. And so you, you let this, this Omicron wave wash in the community with the with the closed border, and then you say enough's enough. And it's all so, too late for that. Yeah. I mean, there was, a, the there was a window of opportunity. I was writing about this in the Herald. I spoke to people in Wellington, to the Ministry of Health, to the Beehive, to people in hospitals, d- district health boards. You know, basically, Wellington was, not Wellington so much, but the Beehive was on holiday. Um, there was an opportunity to completely close the border, say, about two weeks ago, yep. if you didn't want this to come here. Um, I don't agree with this policy, but the Prime Minister has previously said she doesn't want any, you know, one death is too many and that she wants to keep this out. She's still saying her policy is stamp it out for the for, see, for the for the first stage of um, red, which is absurd. But anyway, that's what she says. If she, if she was remotely sincere that she wants to protect people from this, let alone stamp, and stamp it out, two weeks ago, if she had closed the border, it, we would have been fine. She yeah, didn't do reason, that. She like didn't do that. Cases leaking through your like here is different to like you know a, a dozen cases every day being seen in the community, right? Like, like, like keeping an keeping your MIQ in place and allowing you know one or two cases to just leak through the MIQ system is probably is, is, will will enable like a slow wave of, of Omicron, a slowest wave of Omicron to do its thing, rather than allowing you know a dozen cases every day to just. Well, wait a second. South Australia, which is the state we're closest to, went from 24 cases today, which I think is what we had today, to 700 and something within two weeks. Yeah. 
I mean, this goes really fast. You yeah. look at those graphs from Australia. Yeah. And the great crises of 2000 and 2001 don't even appear on the line graphs. They're just these tiny little, almost yeah. unable to be seen. And then you see the straight line. And it's also untrue that this, that Omicron is less likely to kill us. That is not true. Why? If you get Omicron, you are less likely to die yes. than someone who got Delta. That is true. But if you look in Australia, the number of daily deaths currently are double what they were. Oh, because of the higher infection. That's because of higher higher rate. Yeah. So right yeah. now, yeah. each right. New Zealand yeah. person in New Zealand mm. currently has a higher chance of dying of COVID than we did six months ago. And that, that's just a fact because, you know, if you have... But um, is that government incompetence or the virus just getting smarter? Government incompetence. Really? Government incompetence. No, rubbish. It's, it's government incompetence. Garbage. garbage. If, if, look... Separate what you think should happen yes. with what the government wants to happen. The government says it wants to keep us safe, it wants to stamp it out, it wants to do all those things. In that case, it is responsible for moving dishonestly to a rip it up, a, 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 a let it rip strategy, which puts every single New Zealander at greater risk of dying today than six months ago. So Jacinda's taken David Seymour's policy. And that's the policy. policy. That is the policy. Don't They cannot... And I support it. <laughs> I support more death. Thank I you. Support it. The I support it. I support Jacinda Ardern's. I support Jacinda right. Ardern's okay. policy if Thomas. she would tell the truth about it. Thomas, but I wanna, she's lying. I want to. I, I want to go back and I want to. I want to ask you about Matthew Hooten had this theory that Chris Luxon should go out there and say Jacinda's policy is exactly that. Let it rip. Jacinda is out there to kill Grandma. Do you think that if Luxon did that, it would resonate better than whatever soporific nonsense he's pushing at the moment? So is that a question for me? Yes, yeah, I, yes, I think yes. that was, yeah. That was for you. Because <laughs> no one else wants to touch we it, want, Thomas. We want, you've, you've advised the government. We now want you to advise the opposition. Somebody uh, has to. I think, like, it's... There's no kind of rule book for being the opposition, right? Like, like what the stuff he was, Luxon was coming out with this morning of... You know, we, we don't agree with the traffic light system, but if the government was doing better, we could be in orange. But, you know, we have to be in red because the government's kind of screwed up. Oh, my up God, this is boring listening to it the second time. But it was, to be <laughs> fair, know, Thomas, it was even more boring the first but time. Then, You're doing it better than he did. I think that, like, <laughs> I think the problem with that is, like, you know, the, the rule book for the opposition is you're like, you've had, you've had two, you've had three leaders now who have made the mistake of of taking an overly liberal approach on COVID and then having egg on their faces when it all turns to shit. Yes. And, and you know, Luxon, Luxon must know that in about a month or, or, or two's time, you're going to be faced with, you know, tens of thousands of cases a day. Right. And the government will be pointing at him saying he wanted to be an orange, which would make it even worse. No which one would be not interested in that. True. No, when there's 10,000 no, cases a day, no one will be the slightest bit interested what any politician was saying in January. Yeah. Uh, the well, well, and this is what is wrong. Is mice, this is what is, is this is what is wrong with political journalism in New Zealand. No one is going to care about that. But the one thing people do think is that the government should tell them the truth. And right now, the government is shamelessly lying, claiming on the podium of truth podium that of truth. its plan is to stamp it out, that it can cope with fifty thousand cases, that there's tens of millions of RAT kits coming. That is a lie. They know that is a lie. They know that their MIQ system is illegal and that they will lose in court. They have lost every single case in court already. And yet too many, obviously not the New Zealand Herald, but too many <laughs> of that press gallery sit there <laughs> and accept what are obvious lies being told. Not a single journalist said to the Prime Minister, you are lying. When you say your policy is stampeded out, how can you say that if in the next breath you say, and when we get a 1,000 cases a day, blah, blah, blah? How on earth can a prime minister say, I want to stamp it out, but when we get to a 1,000 cases in two weeks? What, this well, is Thomas, insane. It's, this it's, is just it's, ridiculous. Thomas, <laughs> and this is the lies <laughs> from the okay, podium of truth. Hold on, hold on. Let's get Fox News here. Thomas, uh, well, it's, Thomas, you, it's, you it's, give um, me an explanation <laughs> hold on, for why hold on, the prime Matthew. minister is not... Calm routinely down. shown to be a liar on well, the two TV networks. Hold on, both of you, she, both she of you. Obviously lying. Matthew, Matthew Bomber, Schuss. Now, Thomas, um, aren't, aren't you like head of the press gallery down there? No, I'm not. I'm very far. Senior, I'm very senior, far. senior, senior, yeah, senior, I've never, herald, I've herald political. Put my, 
Okay, okay. all right. Well, 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 I think... Chris Gallery 150th party. And Matthew, uh, all right, close enough. Matthew, Matthew... And I did a very good job. It was a great party. Matthew, I'm sure it was. All the politicians in Wellington and Ashley Bloomfield doing skulls with Radio New Zealand. Matthew, shush. The elite establishment. Can somebody shout in this mic? Thomas, Matthew Heaton has made an appalling and scurrilous attack on your noble profession. He has denigrated the fourth estate. He says that you guys are failing abjectly in your job to hold the Prime Minister to account. Tell us why he's wrong. Well, I mean, like, I mean, many of us get, like, cancelled on a weekly basis for <laughs> writing things that would suggest that the Prime Minister is not, in fact, as confident as some people, people say she is. So, you know, for the sake of my mentions, well, you know, you, you need to, you only need to look as far as my mentions and, and the mentions of other people to, to, um, to see there's a differing view. I think, I suppose, like, this, I mean, we haven't we haven't kind of had the political debate yet over what the 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 uh, what the prime minister's strategy currently you know represents. The, the shift, I think, the, the real like political battle was the shift from the elimination strategy to a different strategy, uh, and and yeah, this, this sort of stamp it out kind of approach is very different this year to what we would have understood a stamp it out approach to be like last year. Um, but she seems to be able to make the ca- she seems to be able to make the case that a stamp it out approach is not Thomas, very compatible. Thomas, you're not, you're not, you're not, you're not, you are not, you are not, you are not. Can I just give one other example? No, Thomas, <laughs> Thomas, Thomas, so was not, Thomas, Thomas was he not. A, he's, no, Thomas would make a great politician because that was a great answer, Thomas. But it did not answer the question. We have no, to move on, comrades. No, we no, have to no, move no, we don't. On. I want to. I want to talk about boosters next. I want to. I want to pin Thomas down. D D U. We actually Bloomfield lied about boosters. D U. And no one reported that. <laughs> Matthew, shush. Do you think that the press gallery is doing a good enough job in holding the Prime Minister to account? Matthew Hooton says that the state's lying. Um, do you think the press gallery is doing a good enough job of holding the Prime Minister to account? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay, can I ask you some brief questions? No, no, no. Brief questions. Do you think, Thomas, Thomas, do you think, Thomas... ...looking squeamish at the podium of truth are, like, worth their weight in gold? Thomas, do you think the Prime Minister was telling the truth when she told you on Sunday that the government is ready for 50,000 cases a day? Do you think that was true? So, so, like, you know, quite literally, I was listening to it on my um, headphones okay. at the beach. Um, but uh, it's a lie, isn't it? No, I, okay. I, I, genuinely, I genuinely do not want. I, I, I do not know. Like, I, they do not have. They, 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 they don't have the tests in country at the moment for fifty thousand. Yeah, okay, here's another one. Here's another one. Um, Ashley Bloomfield said that this was. And it's, I've got teenage kids, so this concerns twelve to eighteen year olds who um, are vaccinated and whether they can get the booster. Ashley Bloomfield said on the podium of truth in front of the whole press gallery that nowhere in the world has Pfizer even applied for permission to have boosters to teenagers. Yes, well, that was not That was a straight out <laughs> lie. It's actually yeah. It's not only well, have lie, Pfizer, lie, not lie, only has lie, Pfizer... Yes, well, we do not know whether he was not aware. Well, he's but either pr- America, utterly incompetent it? and ignorant or he's a liar. Yeah. He, he, yeah, not a great he made that statement. Not only is it not true that Pfizer hasn't made applications, boosters are being given to teenagers in the United States and Singapore to name two countries right now. Not a single journalist in the press gallery said, wait a second, that's wrong, Dr Bloomfield. And even now, as Thomas has admitted, the press gallery knows that the words he uttered were untrue. Did they know at the time, though? To be fair, did they know at the time? To be be fair to the press gallery, it's quite hard to fact check someone the second day. They may have taken a quick Google, but to this day, this is now 24 hours, not a single journalist... Although there has not been a press conference... Not a single journalist has even reported that he said something that was completely false, which concerns the health of our children. But they will because you're on there because button. basically they're pawns of the beehive. Okay, well, and we this, have to move this, on. Yeah, let, 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 let Thomas, let Thomas they answer. Are, let Thomas. Well, the beehive and the press gallery have a kind of professional but often hostile relationship. Like, you know, if we were pawns, I feel like I'd be living in a nicer house. 
Okay, we've all, and we've I can, all heard. And I, can, and, all... I can, and I can, and I can tell you, Matthew Hooten is genuinely energised on this issue. Well, you are really any, any passionate time, about this. Any time he gets this. the shit on the press gallery, he gets excited. How, we no, have this to is, move this on, is, this comrades, on to issue two. <laughs> Last week, self-proclaimed bishop Brian Tamaki managed to find the martyrdom he so desperately craves by being imprisoned for breaching his pro- parole conditions. Matthew, with New Zealand's fringes more radicalised by Facebook hate algorithms than ever before, are we providing the environment that is radicalising and triggering possible domestic terrorism by imprisoning Tamaki? Uh, you know, probably, but um, <laughs> there's not much. There's not. There's not much. That, there's not much that can be done about it. I mean, the state tried desperately to keep this guy out of jail. Right. Right. <laughs> Went to court. They. They did. Uh, you know, it's, the judges gave him bail over and over again. Three times. And, right. And then. And then finally, he. They got to the point that You're they couldn't. The now. They couldn't continue giving him bail without the whole system being undermined. So he's been sent to jail. And, I mean, I know that it, it, there has been a protest to free him because apparently that at Mount Eden Prison, the guards there did not allow him to have the face cream that he likes. He likes, he likes the face cream. He likes the face cream. He's uh, a man I who likes it, the face cream. I, I, I haven't got all the details yet, but yes. I think it has something to do with it's a hygiene product, it's some right. type of face cream or something Nivea. like that, yep. which, he was, which in prison he was unable to... To have access it's to, an and so, but it's not really Mandela or Gandhi, is it? Uh, <laughs> if, if you choose follow up question, we saw with the ISIS terrorist that the state's involvement in his surveillance and incarceration became triggers for the supermarket stabbing uh, last year while police broke into a right wing pastor's house to seize his gun. Is the state's response risking a reaction? And are we giving Tamaki the martyrdom he seeks? Uh, he seeks the martyrdom, and he's going to, and he, and you have to have it. I mean, you can't, on one hand, say I'm a freedom fighter, I'm standing up against the state, and then boo hoo, I don't want to go to jail. I mean, the whole point of civil disobedience is you take the consequences that the state imposes upon you. So you know, this is what it's at. Remember, 92 percent of the population, 93 percent of the population are vaccinated. The unvaccinated are a small minority in this country, smaller than the um, vote of, say, the Green Party. Very um, small, and very small, very small, um, small on the. You know, they aren't particularly relevant, and I think they shouldn't get as much media as they do. But of course, yeah, they get Damien, good, Damien, good you sound, wrote, you sound sound bites. Damien, you wrote a defence of Tamaki in the weekend and argued there it was wasn't a double not a defence. It was not a defence of Tamaki. Oh, it was, sorry, sorry. So it was, it was, it was, it was, it was, it was bringing up the double standard between Black Lives Matters protests last year and the way he's been treated. Yeah. What what what? Why why do you think that double standard deserves exploration? Uh, I think it's I think it's we're getting into dangerous territory when we are saying uh, Tamaki is is widely loathed and for for very good reasons. Um, but you saw the Black Lives uh, Matter protesters. I think also school strike for climate may yes. done the same thing. Uh, and the police, in my view, quite rightly, turned a blind eye because it was a political protest and whatever, there are bigger issues at stake. They did not do that with Tamaki. Uh, and the judiciary, I don't think, have a choice. Judges don't have a choice about who was brought before them. They yep. have to assess the cases that are brought. The police do have a choice about who they choose to prosecute. They made a, a conscious decision to go after Tamaki. Now, I don't think they, they were sitting there thinking in their minds, oh, Tamaki's a scumbag, we, you know, we should do this. I think it was just in their mind they knew that pursuing school scri- strike or Black Lives Matter protest, I may be wrong about school strike, but certainly Black Lives Matter broke the law on the COVID thing. They understood that that would be deeply politically uh, unpopular and so they chose not to do it. They knew there would not be a backlash with Tamaki and I was simply making the point that um, exercising the law against individuals because they are loathsome and detested by the majority of the population is a very bad place to be. Follow-up question. Will Brian Tamaki call God as a witness? Yes or no? God is his witness. He will. He. If, the problem with Brian Tamaki, as you're talking about before, he he views himself as Gandhi. I think that's that that is Tamaki's problem. He believes himself to be the Messiah. He's not a Messiah. He is. He he is. He is, a, very he is naughty a, boy. He is a very naughty boy. He he is an idiot. But the fact that he is an idiot does not mean that a double standard should be. Do applied. you think? I mean, this is amateur cycle. I don't think he thinks he's Gandhi. I think he's taking the piss. 
Well, I think that he's he's taken a deep financial hit because he can't have his churches, and I think that this is a good sort of side mm. side advert for him to put, to push it on. Uh, Thomas, other Pentecostal churches have signed a group letter in support of Tamaki and called on other Christians to see a warning in his incarceration. With the rapture level at amber, could this spark religious violence? No. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I copped a bit of heat because I'm not... I, I, I'm not overly concerned about the Tamaki situation. I'm not like, overly concerned about the, the protests against the vaccines or the mandate. It's like... Uh, the, the mandates as they stand are an extraordinary government intervention in our lives and yes. I think people who um, people who don't look at them that way um, are not you know acknowledging that they that, that, that the state is, is is taking a very unusual position and that you know it is effectively you know effectively being the, the important word it is effectively um, forcing people to take some you know medical product which they may or may not want to have. Um, and and you'd, you'd be kidding yourself if you thought that that would not come up against a lot of pushback from some people. Right. Um, and I look at Tamaki and I look at other churches that are, you know, brassed up about it and other people are brassed up about it. And I think, well, you know, like a few thousand people processing on the Parliament lawn about a massive intervention in, in their lives. That seems to me like a lot of Makes sense, right? That makes uh, sense. Yeah, yeah, it's not yeah. that bad. I yeah. mean, you know... Uh, it could be a whole lot worse. You look at America with their low tax rates and, and much you know larger numbers of people, or with a much higher proportion of people, protesting against this sort of stuff. I mean, that, that, that gets quite worrying because it shows that, that, that there is a, a, a widespread distrust of science. But in New Zealand, you know, you have high tax rates. And, and I mean, you would protest if you thought the government was forcing you because the government is you know, effectively yeah. forcing you to take something that you don't want to take inside your own body. You have... You have autonomy of your of what lies, with, you know. Totally, under totally. Your place. My body, it? my choice. My body, my choice. Thomas, you. Well, you, you the, when, your argument. Yeah, Thomas. When when that Wellington protest occurred down there, and the hostility of the crowd was so intense and very much directed at journalists, was that surprising yeah, that for you? Yeah, that happened too. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, <laughs> how, how did the press gallery <laughs> respond to that? You feeling that yeah. absolute raw um, violence was was would would be would be something, wouldn't it? Yeah. Yeah, it was, well, it was interesting because, I mean, Tova did that great package of, you know, comparing them. And I think they sort of saw themselves a wee bit like the January 6th crowd, right? Right. Um, you know, and that, but they weren't. You know, they, they, were, they, were, they were a pretty sad kind of tragic intimidation and, and intimidation of the, the Jan 6th crowd. But I would, like, I, I went out, so what we did, we, we were told to stay away from windows. And, yep. You know, to, to be in certain areas. What they did was they set up this, um, they set up this media area on the colonnade of um, the speaker's balcony for the media to set up cameras and to report from. Yeah. So was, the optics of it were terrible because you had all these people like accusing the media and politicians of being, you know, in each other's pockets and being elitist. And we sort of show up surrounded by marble pillars on the speaker's balcony, you know, with special accreditation to report from there. It's, you know, quite terrible. It sort of proves the point that I was saying. But we also <laughs> like to go down and mingle, um, mingle with the crowd. And, you know, I did. It was great. It was um, it was enlightening. It was quite scary at times, but, but but no one. I never, you know, I didn't um, personally feel uh, threatened or endangered. And, and people were. I, I'm from the South Island. I used to holiday in like Golden Bay, and you know, you meet a few people with interesting views on um, on modern life, and it yeah. was like that. <laughs> Comrades, but, but we, we, New Zealand hippies. Yeah, New Zealand hippie. Comrades, we must move on to issue three. Inflation is out on the 27th with many punters warning of a rate not seen in decades. Will the New Zealand economy falter? Damien, the current upper limit target of inflation by the Reserve Bank is supposed to be 3%. ASB predicts 6%. How good does Adrian Orr have it if he can blow his target by double that and still keep his job? Adrian Noir would appear to be able to blow the sugar off a donut and keep his job. I don't understand why that individual ha- hasn't been fired. Uh, the whole point of, the point of an independent uh, reserve bank uh, is that if you fail to keep inflation within inside the target, you are held to account. Quite clearly, this government has no intention of holding uh, Adrian Orr to account, so I don't just blame Adrian Orr. I believe that Grant Rumbleson needs to hold a high degree uh, of culpability for this. But you're talking about the the inflation numbers out on 
Thursday. Yes. The, if the number is 1.6, that yes. is a huge win because the last 90 days, the number was 2.2% in 90 days. That's the figure to watch. If it comes in at under 22 it means that, that it, inflation was transitory and Adrian Noor should be able to... It's a bonus. He, he, well, he, he doesn't go straight to the gibbet, so I suppose that's a win. But um, if inflation is over 2.2% for the 90 days ending at the 31st of December... Then what that, does that take it to? That, that implies that inflation is actually increasing. And that's where the thing kicks in. So I think the, the number to look at is not how far inflation has travelled in the last 12 months. It's how does the 90 days just gone compared to the September quarter. So if it's under 2.2%, I think that is a, that's a positive result. Still bad, but it but means inflation's going in the wrong direction. But if it goes up, then it's, it's all, it's all if gone. It's, if it's 22 or above, then I think... And listen problems. to these numbers. These are the numbers which really he should be below on an annual basis. And each yeah, quarter correct. Each, each quarter, he's delivering the inflation, through pr- money, mainly through money printing, um, and giving it to the poor through the beehive, which is what causes inflation. Um, he, he's, he's, he's getting it each quarter. I, I think that uh, we are going to be in the most divisive period we have for a very, very long time. Um, the left has told us that the Reserve Bank Act and the trying to control inflation is some right-wing, dastardly, neoliberal, Don Brash-type plot. The argument for controlling inflation was for, for sort of strategic economic reasons, price stability, and people huh. can plan, and, and there are, but, but the main one was to protect the income of the poor. What this is, what this is going to do... Oh, it's so good. It's going to He's actually... Gle- you, can see the, you can see the spittle coming what off his face. Do? What it's going to do? The anticipation. Is anybody who owns a house with a mortgage... The value of their mortgage is going to fall by about six or six. It's like having a negative interest rate on I your know, mortgage. I know, it's great. It's fantastic. While your house will continue to go up, and yes, the eggs and the stuff will go up too, but for people that own houses and have large mortgages, what the price of fish and eggs and stuff don't really matter. Who cares? And this has all been done by a woke Reserve Bank governor who, as you say, in my opinion, is outside the terms of his contract that he has with the ministry. He should be, he fired. Should be fired by Grant Robertson and a woke left-wing government, which is so stupid, it didn't understand that printing money and giving it to the poor would help the rich. It didn't. Matthew, you didn't recently you recently thanked Jacinda's <laughs> housing policy for oh, well, making I support you richer. Her. I support Jacinda entirely. Does <laughs> rising inflation make you politically nervous? Politically nervous. Um, no, because the people won't see it happening to them. Thomas, the major the inflationary pressure for quarter four 2021 will come from transport with a sharp rise in the price of petrol. That's driven offshore. How much can the opposition peg inflation on the government? Um, well, I suppose like opposition sort of should be forward-looking, right? And that, like Simon Bridges put an op-ed and stuff over the break about Joe Manchin and... Um, and you know, has spat with the Democrats over the infrastructure bill. Uh, yeah. Obviously, like Grant Robertson's got the $6 billion operating allowance in the 2022 budget that he has promised to spend, like a record operating allowance. Like the usual operating allowance is about $3 billion for a That's Labour right. government and less than $2 billion for a national government. So, you know, like if Simon wants to make an argument that, um, that, that Grant Robertson doesn't care that increased government spending will lead to higher inflation, then Grant Robertson in the 2022 budget has given him all the ammunition he needs to make that argument. Right. I think Labor's response to it is kind of clear that because Grant's already sort of said um, that most of that six bill is going to go to uh, health care, um, you know, the, the reform of the health system. And he's basically pushing it back on Simon to be like, to, to say, well, you know, you think, um, if you think government spending is causing all of this inflation, what, what line of the health budget would you cut? And cuts of health spending obviously pay terribly, terribly with people. Um, so you, you sort of you, you kind of asking the electorate to choose between increased government spending but higher inflation, lower government spending but a smaller health. Budget. We'll get back quite, to this you know, in more detail, but it seems to me the problem here is with Simon Bridges's attack is he seems to think inflation is primarily a fiscal phenomenon rather than a monetary phenomenon. And yeah, it isn't. Well, that's hard because the money printing stopped. You know, it's really yeah, hard no, but, to go but that's what caused that's stopped. what caused it um, yeah, initially yeah. and. As you say, if you keep arguing it's a fiscal 
um, phenomenon, then there will be some right wing economists that say you don't know what you're talking about, and um, and and the left wing will say, so what are you going to cut? Yeah, but hold on. But in, in response to that, the um, the fifty three billion dollars that Adrian or printed, right? At, at the moment, at least that's a one off, and so mm. you would expect that that would inc- that would generate a one off increase in, in in inflation. The fiscal flow on from that will turn that from a transitory one off into a long term systemic problem. Damien, for uh, follow up question, you have written one billion columns. I counted. Promising economic Armageddon from hyperinflation. Why are you right this time? Well, based on my past track record, I don't think anybody should give any credence. <laughs> See, to this my, is the thing. I think, you're, I think you're right. I think you're totally right this time. Uh-huh. But yes, and and because I consistently, on an annual basis, predict an economic Armageddon. <laughs> and and every, every fifteen years, you'll be right. And, exactly. <laughs> and, and, when, and I've been writing for about thirteen years. So when I am right, I am By going God, to grow right. insufferably <laughs> for another fifteen years. As a Matthew, columnist, you must always write every conceivable opinion. So whatever happens, you can point <laughs> back to it. Matthew, <laughs> follow, follow up question: Who will be more worried on the twenty seventh, Grant Robertson or Adrian Orr? Oh, um, a- Adrian Orr should be because he should know that if that number is anything like what Damien's talking about, he should be fired immediately by the minister. But the minister won't fire him, so he's probably kind, you know, perfectly happy and he can go back to giving speeches in Tereo about um, car retreats. Uh, Thomas, follow-up question. If Russia invades the Ukraine and reprisal sanctions <laughs> inadvertently push Iran into Russia's waiting arms, oil prices and supply constraints from China's zero COVID response will continue to drive up prices, making inflation bite down. Deeper. What can Jacinda do to alleviate the external price pain? Hell of a segue there, Bob. How good was that? How good was that? <laughs> well, you made a sort of press release saying we have an independent foreign policy and have nothing more to say. You know. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a fantastic response. We have to break right now for Damien Grant for an advert. Damien Grant. Uh, look, as you know, this is a difficult podcast to get sponsors for. Don't know why, but we we have a regular and consistent sponsor here, and that is Gravity Credit Management. Uh, excellent bunch of guys. They are just across the road from my practice at Waterstone. The thing about... So I was chatting to uh, the director, uh, Andrew Kingston, uh, on Friday, and one of the things that Gravity does, which we, uh, which uh, he's pushing out quite heavily and he wants me to talk about, is Gravity buys debts. So if you're running a business and you've got debts at 180 days or older, chances are, Andrew points out, you're not going to collect those debts. If you sell them to Gravity, Gravity will collect those debts. They'll either buy them outright for 5, 10, 15 cents in the dollar, whatever it is, or they will buy those debts for a nominal amount and give you a percentage of what they recover. Gravity has its own team of in-house lawyers. So uh, Gravity would like your support, and the more people who swing by to Gravity, the longer Bomber and I can continue with this madness. So 0800 Gravity gravitycredit.co.nz, they would love your support and Bomber and I would be delighted if you could lend them your ears. Comrades, we must move on to issue four. The drums of war are beating frantically as Russia seeks to restore its sphere of influence over the Ukraine. From Moscow's perspective, the uprising in Kazakhstan last Kazakhstan last month is part of the West's hybrid war doctrine. Damien, the water trucks are now at the head of the tanks and armoured vehicle columns, meaning war is imminent. With 125,000 troops, however, Russia can't occupy the Ukraine, meaning Putin is eyeing up a military adventure to take more Caspian Sea assets. Will Biden successfully impose sanctions to stop him? Biden doesn't know what day it is, so I don't think that Biden's going <laughs> to do Biden, Biden's not going to do anything. Yeah. I think that what Vladimir Putin, he's, he's doing two things. One, he's looking for a seat back at the table ever since they, they kicked him out of the G8 or G7. Uh, but the other thing is he saw how we got away with uh, Crimea and he's looking at the Donbass and he's, uh, we're, when we were talking off air about Odessa, uh, I think that's entirely possible. He knows he can go in there. These are areas with predominantly Russian speakers. He's not going to face a significant opposition. I think Putin remembers the absolute disaster that Chechnya was for Moscow and I don't think he has any appetite to repeat it. 
and I don't think Russia could withstand the economic consequences of uh, of a full scale invasion of Ukraine. They're not going to Kiev. Um, so if there is an incursion, I think it's going to be very limited. And Putin's already, uh, that, uh, Biden's already kind of given the indication that ah, they can take a little bit. They've already taken a bit, a bit more is fine. Damien, and and, and yep. the, the other thing to remember, yep. that, that Putin made it in some ways not a strategic mistake, but Crimea's got something like 10, 13 million predominantly Russian speakers. In the Ukrainian elections, they, they, vote, they, voted, they voted for Russian-leaning candidates. Now they're out... The Ukrainian-leaning candidates, or the the Ukrainian nationalists, are uh, are stronger, and so the chances of getting a Moscow-friendly leader in Kiev is reduced. And so, Putin has less incentive now to try and influence what's happening in Kiev, and more incentive to, to go and grab land. Follow-up question: Wouldn't Russian sanctions drive Iran deeper into Putin's arms, disrupting the nuclear fuel negotiations and causing more? Oil price instability. Hold on, we're we're we're, we're moved on to Iran now. Have well, we? if, if well if, if 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 sanctions come on Russia, Russia can lean on the Iranians to stop the fuel deal with the Americans as part of a a, a punchback. I I think you may be looking a little bit too deeper. I'm not too sure that any of the people running this thing have necessarily a, a plan. I don't think Putin necessarily knows what he wants. By, by putting the troops in there. So remember that the Americans have, have got this whole big, we're doing a pivot to Asia, right? Um, and so Putin is sitting there saying, well, great. Well, if you're, if you're focused on Taiwan, you're not really focused on uh, what's happening uh, in the Crimea. Um, I don't have a view on what the hell's going on in, in Iran. And, and, and it's probably good for Iran because everybody's focused now on Hong Kong and Taiwan and, and the Donbass region. So they can probably get away a little bit more with, with what they want. So I I yeah you know, I I I don't know that there's that sort of wider agenda that you're talking about. Matthew, would Israel respond to breakthrough Iranian nuclear technology with a preemptive strike against Iranian nuclear installations this year? Well, that's their policy. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that's they, true. That's actually and their they policy. Did it, and they did it. I think to to Iraq in the eighties. Yes, and, that's right. And I think they shouldn't be yep. under any illusion. I do one. Yeah. Anyway, that if if um, the Islamist terrorist regime in um, in in Tehran has uh, a nuclear capability, they will seek to complete what Hitler started. So, from their point of view, they will stop that if they have to, and if others don't, that would have an enormous impact on oil prices globally. I don't think that's concern of the Israeli government. Or the survival. <laughs> no, I think damn. the survival of the Jewish people <laughs> after two thousand. What about my cheap gas? After yeah, four yeah, thousand yeah. years of almost everybody trying to kill the Jews, they're not going to be humorous they're, about they're, it. They're, they're, <laughs> they're, they're, <laughs> no, no, they take these things very sure, seriously. Sure, they do. They yeah. do. A follow-up question: Will China take a Russian invasion of the Ukraine? As a moment to also challenge Biden, if you've got if you've got them both playing up at the same time, America's far less likely to do anything. Right? Every, everybody is great powers do this to one another. I think in the case of Ukraine, um, it's not a member of NATO. It doesn't have a US security guarantee, and I think the Russians can do whatever they like. What it, you know, the cost to them would only be uh, economic. There would not be a military response by the United States, and so I don't. Fe- and, and of course, both sides, thank goodness, have nuclear weapons which keep us safe. I think the more dan- you know, I think Taiwan is is. Uh, you don't think that's likely, do well, you? I think again. I think that um, our, you know, our, the nuclear deterrent, which um, means is the only reason all of us are alive. Um, our friends in the nuclear arms industry who have kept the peace since 1945. Um, I think that will, in the end, prevent a forced invasion of um, Taiwan. Do you think you could see something in Hong Kong, maybe, though? China doing something um, in Hong Kong? Hong Kong is sovereign Chinese territory and nobody would raise a finger to defend um, Taiwan, certainly not at the risk of a nuclear Armageddon. So, again, we can thank... um, Nuclear umbrellas. Nuclear weapons. Uh, In fact, of course, one of the few countries in New Zealand which, you know, doesn't benefit from um, the peacemaking aspects of nuclear weapons is New Zealand. Right, so more nuclear weapons, less press gallery. Great. Thomas, mm. has Biden's that disastrous... Be better, <laughs> has Biden's disastrous <laughs> Afghanistan failure damaged American power? Is this why Putin is trying it on? Afghanistan to, to the Ukraine. I like... Is that what... 
it, it feels like this is the, the natural end point of 30 years of post-Cold War history now, yep. whether or not, you know, Putin decided to pull the trigger because of Biden's weakness over Afghanistan. I mean, yes, it possibly was the tipping point, um, because it does seem to have emboldened him. But it sort of seems like this is inevitable at one point or another, right? Like, Ukraine has made his intentions very clear in terms of pivoting to the West, and um, you can see why it was want to, to pivot uh, that way. Um, and Putin, obviously, and, and actually, you know, Russian foreign policy in general has, for 30 years, tried to rebuild its sphere of influence in the former Soviet republics. And it would naturally try to defend its sphere of influence at a point at which its historic adversary is weak, which it is now. I think, like, yeah. I think you know, we also, you Biden know... Biden is weak and he will be weak forever. Yeah. We underestimate the humiliation of 1991. Um to, to ordinary Russian people, yeah. and that's what has, has secured Putin in office, and why people like him. And you know, it, it was it, from the Cold War. It was obvious that the Soviet, you know, the monstrous Soviet socialist republic would fail. A great experiment. They killed under a million people. Sure, Obviously, sure. socialism can't work. Got to break some eggs. It, it always fails, <laughs> and, cap- eggs. and capitalism always succeeds. Wow. And therefore, <laughs> therefore. Um, it was always obvious that eventually oh. the United States would win the Cold War. However, very sad. Just imagine. I mean, it's against the laws of mathematics and economics. But let's try it. But just imagine the Soviet state that, that it was the United States society that fell over. Great dream. Yes. Great dream. And and this and the and the peacemaking leader of of the Soviet Union comes to Washington and says, Great "We're going to help. Yes. And here are some experts. And yep. and we we're going to give you some advice on five year plans. On yeah, on well, hundred day plans. It was <laughs> to, to transition, but this will be five year. Sure, and, sure, sure. And and we're all friends now. And the new president of um, the United States is a complete drunk like Yeltsin, and it's yep. sort of embarrassing. Yes. And then and then they say, and we'll help you with your nuclear weapons. Yep. Check they're safe. And yep. here's what. The, and the gulags. And, and, oh, and by the way, Texas wishes now to be independent. Yes, sure, 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 and sure. So does California, and that's. And I, I, I think at the time we all thought because we looked at all this through the free oh, world lens, we yep. thought, oh, won't the Russian people be thrilled that that we're helping them? <laughs> they weren't. You know, really, we're helping they them. They weren't very thrilled. Here we were are they? to help, and I don't think. And and, and that, isn't that wonderful thing about that new funny president called Yeltsin, and you know, and he seems to be Bill Clinton's mate, and. How is an ordinary, proud Russian going to respond to that? And they not hated well. it. And not the West well. did not. Um, the, the West did not take into account that deep hurt that Putin has used to uh, for his whole political machine. And now he wants to return the Ukraine. And wh- why would quick, you? Quick round from each of you: one to ten, ten being the highest chances of military intervention by Russia into Ukraine. Damien, three. Thomas. Yeah, I'd, I'd also go below five. I'll go three. Thank <laughs> you. If, if it's military action of some sort, I'll go 10. Yeah, 10, 11. I'm yeah. 11. Yeah, but, yeah, but it's, it, all, yeah. it's already started. They started yeah. the cyber war last week. Yeah. Uh, comrades, we need to wrap now with a final word. Damien Grant, your rant for, th- for 90, se- 90 seconds? Jesus, it's a long we time. Can't make that. Go to the mountaintop, brother. Uh, <clears throat> my, my concern, the thing that worries me at the moment, as we were talking before about inflation, and my frustration, and Thomas, I'm going to hold you liable for this, is that the press gallery <clears throat> and the financial journalists keep talking about the annualised inflation rate, right? So you say, how much has inflation gone up in the last year? And I'm telling you, sir, nobody cares. It's irrelevant. What, ha- what, what? It's like looking at a train as it zips past you and thinking, how far has that train gone in the last, uh, in a 365 days. Yeah. What matters is the speed that the train is going now. Mm. And in the last 90 in the last 90 days, a quarter ending in September, the train was going at 2.2 percent a quarter. On an analysed basis, that is nearly nine percent. That is a catastrophic rate if it continues. And so, when the inflation figures comes out on Thursday, what would be great if the journalists would not report on how far we have come in the last 365 days? What I want to see is journalists saying, right, inflation is now running at an annualised rate at whatever it is, because that is the figure that banks and the Reserve Bank and everybody else looks at. It's just frustrating that financial journalists haven't quite cotton on to that. So I'll yeah, be although, looking... Although what people, 
what on. people want to know is to compare to like inflation now versus inflation, you know, ten years ago. I, I want to I want to look at like my annual inflation rate, twenty twenty two, or twenty twenty one. In the case of these, so these numbers, and was it as bad as this, you know, ten years ago? I don't know a single uh, person, no, Thomas, that's interested in that. I think what people want to know exactly is what inflation is doing right now and also what that means for the Ford forecast. They want to know what a broccoli will cost in three months' time. I'm not sure how Matthew Hooten has got into Damien's 90-second rant, but okay. <laughs> Thomas, Thomas, your final word this week, please. Sir. Uh, my, uh, yeah, my, my, my rant is going to be on inflation, but my, my, my rant will be on I'm trying to think actually this will be a good moment for New Zealand um, because I think it is probably time for us to kind of... Um, uh, in terms of our mentality to to cease to be as afraid of the virus as we have been in the past, I think probably, you know, there's a very good reason to be fearful of the virus. It is terrifying. It has killed a lot of people. Um, but, I, you know, culturally, I think New Zealand's in a fairly bad position where we are excessively afraid of it. Um, there is a lot. There are a lot of people who are making up their own rules about how to live with this virus because they are more afraid of it than they need to be. Um, I think I'm looking forward to the ground of Kiwis case, which has been delayed. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not a, I'm not a, my, my second, you know, legal list. I, I'm not a, a Jeffrey Palmer kind of written constitution kind of guy, um, or, you know, Supreme Law constitution kind of guy. But it is quite, it has been quite alarming to me uh, over the last few years, the extent to which the government can make quite severe interventions in our lives without any pushback from anyone. Um, so it'll be good to see what the Grand Kiwis case manages to do with regard to that, because it, it does seem to me that there should be some kind of boundaries on what the state should be allowed to do uh, to combat any kind of um, threat to to your lives, uh, to our lives. I mean, you know, again, don't like Supreme Law constitutions; they are kind of you know unworkable as we see in the United States. But at the same time, it is quite um, unnerving what a government can do overnight in terms of uh, stopping people from visiting the country that they uh, have citizenship. I mean, thank you, Thomas. Matthew, your final word this week. Yeah, I'll go along with that MIQ situation. The government has successfully delayed the case. And, of course, they've got rid of this most uh, recent uh, lottery for um, March and April. Mm -hmm. And I think the government will be determined uh, that that case is not heard, that uh, the issue behind it, the MIQ system, the MIQ lottery is abolished prior to that going to the court because I think the government knows that it will lose that case. Um, I'm sure it's probably been advised it'll lose that case if it goes to a hearing. And of course, um, if it does, uh, that will raise the question of um, damages, reparations. And there are a million people overseas who have got who will have a court judgment that says that their basic rights under the Immigration Act and under the Bill of Rights Act have been abused by Jacinda Ardern and her regime. They'll have a court case saying that, and, and they will be able to sue for the suffering that they have experienced wow. as a result. We'll t- we'll, we'll and that will out. have an enormous fiscal impact as well as being deeply humiliating. So you look to the government to try and settle that case and you look to it abolishing the whole system before that court hearing. All right, so before uh, uh, Bob Maritz off, I'd just like to say, uh, Thomas, thank you so much for coming uh, on. Uh, uh, excellence. Pleasure. Uh, and um, I think, uh, Thomas, you have your own podcast called On the Tiles, and I listened to that with uh, with Matt, Max uh, Rash, Rashbrook. Am I saying that right? It's excellent, uh, isn't it? Yeah. The New Zealand Herald product. Yeah, yeah. And, um, and no, look, it was, a, it was really interesting. I've listened to the one you did with uh, Close Warbrook and with Simon Bridges. Uh, some really excellent interviews. People should check that out. And, Matthew, you have your own Patreon where not only can you buy uh, Matthew's uh, opinions in the Herald, you can buy, you can pay extra to listen to Matthew. So if you don't get enough Matthew Hooten from the Herald, you can pay extra to get Matthew Hooten on Patreon, and I subscribe, and it's excellent. Thank Bomber. you, comrades, to my final word this week. When Omicron...
comes around. I think the shockwave of real levels of sickness and death will stun a complacent shire. This country will become delirious with illness and fear, and in our feverish malaise, we will turn to false prophets like Brian Tamaki, Christopher Luxon, Mike Hosking, <laughs> and David Orr. Seymour, who for a split <laughs> second of illness-induced insanity will sound slightly reasonable. Such will be the depths of generational poverty that Omicron will exploit. The solutions promised by the political architects of that inequality will sound like hope. New Zealand will be blighted by this as Omicron exploits exposes the inequality that we all have fastidiously ignored. The misery we're about to endure will rip our egalitarian facade aside. Here's Tom with the weather. That was the Working Group, New Zealand's greatest <laughs> weekly political podcast that isn't funded by New Zealand On Air. Our thanks to Matthew Hooten, Thomas Coughlin, Damien Grant and Twitter panellist Tim Selwyn. This will be uploaded on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Rover and YouTube. We will see you live 7.30pm next Monday. Kia ora and ka pai. Thank you. That was New Zealand's greatest weekly political podcast, The Working Group. Not one minute of this show was funded by New Zealand On Air. Nope, no creamy public broadcasting money for us. That was The Working Group.